So everybody, welcome to our second training class. Um, glad that we made it through the first one and now happy that we're at the second one. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, most, about two thirds of the people have sent pictures. If there's a check by your name, we have your picture. If there's not a check by your name, but you sent us a picture, uh, text or put it in the chat or, or text Robert or me, and um, we'll go back and see if we can find it. So um, that's the pictures. We sent out a pretest um, maybe a couple weeks ago, and I resent it with a list of you need to do these three things. And we have everybody but three people filled it out. And that pretest is really for the uh, AgriLife advisor. Uh, we didn't make it up or anything, but we're trying to help him collect this, this in, uh, information. So uh, if you need the link again, just let me know. And we sent out a class one quiz. And again, almost everyone filled it out. It's um, it's something you can retake. So if you are a person that likes to get every get all the answers correct, you can do it on this one because it lets you take it as many times as you want to. So um, this just wanting to make sure that you guys uh, are learning something from our classes. So take the quiz. It's I I even had to take it. So there you go. And we've had quite a few of you log on to VMS, which is the Texas Parks and Wildlife Va Volunteer Management System. And that's where you enter your classes when we when they when the field trips when we start happening, you'll enter your field trips. It's where you enter your volunteer time. Um, we sent the link out to it. If you've forgotten your password, it's also where you where you registered for class, if you forgot your password, we can send you a link to reset your password. So just let us know. But we're, I'm really happy. Usually at the beginning of class, it, it takes people weeks to start getting onto the VMS system. And, and it's really, it's something that the more you do it, the easier it becomes. So thanks to all you that already have done it. And I'm sure a bunch of you'll start doing it soon and uh again if, to keep up with what's going on with the chapter we post things on on our facebook page if you're not if you don't have a facebook page and then it's really really important to get on our uh email listserv it's important to be on both of them but it's especially important if you're if you're not on facebook and that's where we talk about all the opportunities for volunteering, training, um, different things. So those are the two best sources of, of information about the chapter. And tonight is our archeology span and geology night. We've got uh, Rolando Garza, the uh, Chief of Resource Management at Palo Alto National, Battle, National Historical Park. Um, I sent his uh, bio to you as well as Dr. Gonzalez. So I won't read it to you, but I will tell you this. I grew up less than 30 miles from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And I did not know that there was anything related to the Civil War in Texas, let alone the southernmost tip of Texas. And the first time I went to uh, Palo Alto was with uh, one of the training classes. And besides being a beautiful uh, place, we met Rolando, who is the most enthusiastic person about his, his, uh, about archaeology and about Palo Alto. And he just brings the whole place to life. So you're very lucky to um, have him presenting tonight. And with that, 
I will stop thank, here. Thank you very much for saying that, Barbara. <laughs> um, and oh, you mean that I, I'm from? I, I'm I from just close got. To I just got lucky, and I. I I've got my dream job in a home in my hometown in a national park that wasn't here when I left for college, which is pretty cool. It's fun. I love what I do, and I hope y'all come out and volunteer with me and and uh, get to know me and get to know the park and and the resources. Okay, so my share thing is still not available. I to know. Okay. I'm trying. Right. Come on, Barbara. <laughs> no, sorry. I can't. Hey, let me <laughs> let me say a few shout outs to some friends of mine. Uh, Adrian Wheatley, Ed Mesa, of course. Great. Uh, I'm sorry I shared your phone number with somebody today, Ed. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> and an old high school chum of mine that I recognize early on in this, uh, Michelle Cano. Uh, yeah, it's been years. <laughs> Rolando, yay! <laughs> hey, Michelle. We went to like those. Um... The little bag. Luminadios. That's yeah. That's, that's live. Last okay. time I saw you. Uh, <laughs> welcome, uh, welcome. <laughs> yeah. When you gave a, a sandwich to poor Richard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got after Richard. Why are you eating yeah. modern food when we were dressed up as period soldiers? <laughs> <laughs> that was so fun, though. Good memories. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's good. And I enjoyed high school. I just remember the good things in life. That's why I'm happy. And high school, I guess it wasn't great, but it was a lot of fun in my memory, so. <laughs> okay, now you're the presenter. Okay, I'm going. All right, and let me see. Okay, y'all see nothing but the PowerPoint? Hello? Yes, we see it. Okay, just the PowerPoint, not not the not the other things, not the slides. Okay, yes, I'm Rolando Garza. I'm the archaeologist, chief of resource management uh, here at uh, Palo Alto Battlefield. And uh, anybody who knows me know I do nothing brief. That's why the words uh, italicize. I'm going to try and give you a brief summary of the archaeological resources of the Rio Grande Delta. Of course, I won't be able to cover everything. I'll just kind of hit hit a broad spectrum of stuff and I hope you enjoy it. I'll definitely um, be available for questions at the end of this presentation and um, and afterwards. Um, and what okay, I'll just go on. Archaeology. What is archaeology? It's the study of past human cultures through the material culture remains utilizing the scientific method. It's a subdiscipline anthropology, which is a scientific study of human beings. Um, so basically, we study the past based upon what is left in the ground. I like to say, you know, I'm a historic archaeologist. I got into archaeology because of prehistory. That's what really excited me. But it's nice having the historic record. But what's the problem with the historic record is everything is biased. Everything has a point, every, every, anything, any, any written, any, even though it's in black and white, it has a bias, uh, whether it's conscious or subconscious bias that was added to the thing. It does. I like to say archaeology, especially in what I do in battlefield archaeology, it gives a empirical data, empirical, unbiased information. Of course, it can be misinterpreted, but it is, it is there. And that's why we use a scientific method to collect this data. So we have it and we, we document everything. We do it exclusively that way. If we misinterpret the data based upon our own personal bias, somebody later can re-examine that data and hopefully come to a better understanding. What I like to say, archaeology gives a more accurate depiction of what happened in the past because it, it's unbiased. So, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the Rio Grande Delta. This is this is essentially it, uh, the Rio Grande Delta. It's not just an archaeological, it is a geological form, which hopefully our next presenter, uh, Juan Gonzalez, a good friend of mine, will uh, will confirm. That is kind of the boundaries of the Rio Grande Delta. Um, Paleo Indians. Paleo Indians are the first evidence of human civilization or human, human society in the new world 
Um, and about 11,000 to 8,000 years ago in this area, in deep South Texas, that is where we have supporting evidence. These are um, no paleo points, uh, Folsom and Clovis at the top, Scotts Bluff and Angostura at the bottom line. Um, what is crazy or what is what really piqued my interest when I first started discovering this, these points, which represent the Paleo Indian period, are found all over the new world. It's the technology. We study technology and we, you know, archaeologists put arbitrary periods on the past based upon our understanding and concept. So as we grow as a science, as we grow as an understanding, we definitely have to adjust. But uh um but in technology slips, we kind of add and add to that. You know, here, this far back, you know, the only thing that really remains are stone artifacts. That's the big item here. Um, and what does the Rio Grande Delta not have? Stone artifacts. Anyway, I think I get ahead of myself. But the, okay, uh, so we go on to the paleo. Indian period, and it's a shift in technology, the introduction of the atlatl, which served as an extension of a person's arm. It increases velocity and range. And what happened? The Paleo Indians are known as the big game hunters. Let me see. I'll, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back one slide just because I like that previous slide. Uh, um, one more, I guess. Uh, bear with me. Even one more. Uh, Paleo Indians, they're known as the big game hunters. The mastodons, the mammoth, the woolly sloths, all that. But back in this period, probably about 8,000 years ago, these uh, Pleistocene era megafauna were probably no longer here in this region. And uh, these guys were exploiting new the new modern game herds. But the Paleo Indians can be characterized small bands of people carry, uh, uh, using a large range, subsiding over a large range of territory. And I'll we can go back to the archaic period. Archaic period, with the invention of the Adelado, they're following the modern game herds. Uh, and that with the Adelado, like I said, it increases the range of velocity. But these are the points. The archaic period. Can it's a kind of boom in society. It's about it starts about eight thousand years with that, and you get these smaller points because they're on on darts on darts which are thrown with an atlatl. And the shift, and it's it's you're getting more more people, bigger bands exploiting smaller territory ranges, and uh and and uh, exploiting more resources. Then you have the middle cart. One thing that's important about that 4,500 year date is that's when the modern coastline was formed. What we know where the barrier islands, Padre Island, all that, about 4,000 years ago, that's when this coastline was, um, was stabilized, which we know today. And in the middle archaic, it is a definitely a boom, a population explosion. Um, and they're 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 using that lateral. They're exploiting the they're following and, and exploiting the modern game herds, but they're also exploiting a wide range of other things from from uh, fruits, berries, uh, oasis, everything, rabbits, um, all that. And you just have a big population explosion during that period. And you also get the the stone pipe in this. You get it just they have. More time, more time. It's they're not scrambling. They aren't going so far. They have more sediment. Of course, all these people are still considered hunter and gatherers. In in uh, the Rio Grande Delta, all the prehistoric people remained hunter and gatherers. They never got into into uh, into uh, uh, cultivation of of crops or anything. But the stone pipe came in. Items like this, leisure items. As you see, the life is changing for them. And like this, a rabbit stick. Of course, this is not an archaic person. This is somebody from the 19th century in the southwest of the United States. But they use that. It's kind of like the American boomerang. It's except it wouldn't. It doesn't come back. 
they use it to hit. They're they're exploiting more and more resources as as you know they they need to. The population and the carrying capacity, you know, kind of starts exceeding it. Um, and say in the middle archaic, I said the modern estuary, the modern coastlines established with this. This is actually a picture of Loma Alta and Loma Alta Lake and the Loma Alta behind it, which is a, a very important to the archaeological record of Cameron County. And then late archaic, you get an, another shift in technology. Uh, you're getting smaller points. The resource, like I said, they kind of extended. There was a big population boom during the middle archaic, kind of exceed the carrying capacity, and you start to uh, you start to um, drill the size. They're, they're more uh, exploiting more and more different resources here to go through. Then you get into the late prehistoric, and this is the introduction of the bull and the arrow out here. These are the points that we get here in Cameron, Hidalgo, and in our uh, Tamaulipas on the Mexican side of the border. These are the points. So all these right here are known as Cameron points. But the big thing is, archaeologists call the late prehistoric period the Brownsville Complex. Um, and it's the main thing. What did I say earlier that the Rio Grande Delta doesn't have? is stone artifact. So what you see in sites are mainly just finished tools and that. But the Brownsville Complex can be can be uh, separated by three distinct traits. First is the use of stone, I mean of shell artifacts. The, they had a magnificent shell industry, which led to the second trait, which is uh, trade with Mesoamerica. They had that that's established. We have items here on sites uh, that are sourced from Mesoamerica, which I'll, I'll show you right now in a little bit. Uh, but that is all based on the on the shell industry, which was a major trade item. Uh, and then was the use of distinct burial sites for hunter and gatherers, which is which is somewhat unusual. You know, not is using burial sites time after time, even though. But the range of that, and there was the estuaries and the marine resources which allowed these people to thrive here in the Rio Grande Delta in the late prehistoric period. The conch, is the, that well conch is their main item used. Uh, this is from the Colomea. They made darts for gigging, uh, flounder, stuff like that. They also made danglers. These were the trade items, the ornaments. They also used ornaments. They're also heavily ornaments, which is evidence in some of the barrels we find here. Excuse me. Little danglers. And these are all from a collection of a good friend of mine, Don Kelpie, who has an extensive collection. He kind of models himself after A. Anderson, which I've neglected to say A. Anderson gives us the, the breadth of the foundation of archaeological knowledge that we know about the prehistoric cultures down here. He was a county engineer from 1920 to about 1940. He systematically collected the sites here. All of his collection is at uh Texas Archaeological Research Lab in Austin, which is part of the University of Texas, and many students have studied it. But that is the breath. You know why? That is, like I said, the heart of what we know about the prehistoric cultures down here, because there hasn't been wide-scale scientific investigations down here. No big dam projects. Just not a lot of scientific research down here. This is the body of the well conch. You can see. They groove, they groove, they use a little stone drill or so, and they make a groove in there and they snap. That's how you tell that they have uh, this was also, like I said, it's the ornaments or their huge trade items with Mesoamerica. They have control hooks, also use tools for it. This is a, a photo from a burial site up at Taro now. The, um, it's called the Crager site. It's up in uh, outside of Harlingen. But they also use other marine sources like the Dulcinea scrapers they use for cleaning, cleaning um, hides, scraping uh, the scales off of fish. These are these are the main tools, the cockle shell, the 
the quay hog, which is at the bottom, which is a heavy duty, it's used as a hammer. Um, it's used as a hammer for, for all sorts of working with that. And then the pumice, which comes in naturally off the shore, that's used as a braider for skins, for, for uh, some of the ceramics that are down here and other items and still. And then Oliva shell tinkers, which are nice. This is a, these are two uh, actual artifacts and then two of the modern shells next to it. They would put a coyote tooth in the middle and observe and they wear them on the body. This is a burial from the uh, Floyd, Moore, Floyd Moore site, which was excavated in the late 60s. Uh, and they're all flex burials, the amount of uh, ornaments in it. We know them. This is also from uh, the Floyd Moore site. You can see these artifacts of the coyote tooth in there and bone artifacts, shells. Uh, as I mentioned, there's evidence of trade with Mesoamerica. Of course, this is not an actual artifact. This is just a piece of jade I, I got out. All the stuff is up in Taro, which um, I have not uh, had the, the need or the ability to go up there and go through the collection. Turpentine and obsidian. Obsidian is a volcanic rock which cooled rapidly. It is uh, like glass, so it is a very sharp tool. We have stuff, uh, artifacts in the in the Anderson collection that have uh, of uh, obsidian that has been sourced to these three sites over the past. We also have ceramics which are mainly considered trade items, but there is evidence that they have made some of the ceramics copying out of the Huasteca region, which the Huasteca region, this is a Anderson vessel. This is the, the, the imagery on this vessel is definitely from Huasteca, which is just south of us at the Southern end of Tamaulipas. These are some of the vessels in the Anderson collection. Just wanna show you some of the sites which is unusual for hunter and gatherers to, to have ceramic artifacts. Uh, but since they had such a sophisticated shell working industry, they're able to trade and they didn't have to, their range was kind of tight because they, they had such big marine resources um, that they were able to stay. And, and these, these ceramics were mainly found in burial context. Here's the Huastecan region and the Huastecans acted as, as I guess, a interliers for the for the trade with actual Mesoamerica where the where the obsidian other serpentine and jade artifacts came from. Then we come to the historic period with the colonization in the 18th century of of uh, I'm sorry I just finally caught that there are, are comments coming in but I didn't pay attention of that in this area in the 1700s when the historic period. You know, unfortunately, and it's mainly because of the disease, by, by the end of the 18th century and 1800, most of the native populations were wiped out and mainly by, uh, by uh, European disease. And the other ones were kind of assimilated up, went into the San Antonio mission systems or that. But this is what we call the Nuevo Santa Dead colonial region. Then we come to what? I'll, I'll just kind of breeze past the, that period because I've never done any excavation, anything in the colonial, early colonial period, but this is my heart. This is what I have been working on for years out here is the U.S.-Mexican War. And in 1845, the summer of 1845, Texas voted to be annexed as a state in the Union. President Polk, who as a senator, had uh, been trying hard to, to get California and New Mexico and Texas territories into the United States, uh, finally succeeded as president in getting Texas to become a state. And he guaranteed Texas the Rio Grande River as their southern boundary. Now, that includes New Mexico, Taos and uh, uh, Santa Fe and all that, which, and, which is all that which is part of Mexico. And at this time, you know, we all know uh, the Texas Revolution in 1836 and signing of uh, the Treaty of Velasco, 
where Texas claimed this and they acted as a republic, but Mexico still claimed all this territory because it was there. It was, it was New Mexico and that. And um, you know, I like um say, uh, but any Mexican president that was involved that could not stay in office if he was trying to negotiate with Texas to give him that boundary. And this boundary over here, what Texas, this was during the colonial and the young Republic period, that was always the boundary of Texas, that small piece over there, starting at the Nueces River. So in the spring of 1846, after Taylor in, in, the, in the summer of 1845, uh, President Polk's General Zachary Taylor with half of the US Standing Army, which is only about 5,000 troops to Corpus Christi as an army of observation. The spring of 1846, he sent them down after negotiations had failed, because I said any president could not negotiate with the United States over the territory. So in the spring of 1846, Polk sent Taylor down to, um, to set up a post on the banks of the, of the Rio Grande River. Taylor chose um, um, a spot opposite of the city of Matamoros uh, to set up an outpost, he used the 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 deep water channel at Brazo Santiago Pass, which was across from the old fishing village of Punta de Isabela, uh, as a way to get his supplies. And he set up Fort Polk there as a wharf to get his supplies. Um, as they were constructing the fort uh, during the spring of 1846, uh, in April of 18 on April 25th of 1846, uh, a scouting party of 45 Dragoons was overtaken by a regiment of, of uh, Mexican uh, Lancers or cavalry, which, okay, while while Taylor was starting the construction of Ford in March of 1846, uh, you know, Mexico was already at war. They saw the U.S. coming, crossing the oasis and coming on to their sovereign territory as an act of war. And so they were amassing the Army of the North in the city of Matamoros. And I, I like to say when I when I'm talking to the public or doing living history, uh, mainly because my family was down here in the 18th century, the people that lived on the river and that were down here were not affiliated with Texas. They were they were Mexican citizens, all that. And that's the way they viewed a lot. A lot of the, the old history down here calls, oh, was nobody lived here, which which is um, not exactly the truth. Anyway, uh, that spring, the the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma would unfold, as well as the siege of Fort Polk. And that will be the the heart of my of my presentation is the archaeological investigations we conducted at these battlefields. May eighth, eighteen forty six, the Battle of Palo Alto, the Mexican army uh, under General Mariano Rista, who had come into charge in late April, uh, coming from Mexico City, intercepted General Zachary Taylor on the road to Matamoros, the road that connected Matamoros to the fishing village of, of Point Isabel. Taylor had left uh, the fort, uh, the earthen fortification, which would become known as Fort Brown, under uh, the command of Major Jacob Brown to finish construction and hold the fort at all costs while he went back to, uh, to Fort Pork to gather supplies to withstand a lengthy siege. That was on May the 1st. Um, on May the 3rd, um, Mexican troops from Matamoros started bombarding the fort. And uh, Torreon and a force of about 3,600 troops had already crossed the river and all that, waiting for Taylor to come back. On, uh, and it is, as it's sold, uh, Taylor could hear at Port, at Port Isabel, at Fort Polk, they could hear the sound of far off cannon fire, which was the bombarding of the, of the earthen fortification which would be known as Fort Brown. So on May the 8th, afternoon, May the 8th, um, about 3,500 troops intercepted about 2,500 U.S. troops on the road to Matamoros. An artillery battle ensued here. We uh, we kind of know it was the Broad Prairie. You know, in the past, and during the latter part of the 20th century, this battlefield has been moved as far east as Loma Alta that was mainly because in in before World War One, troops from uh, troops from Fort Brown would use this as artillery range. But we know how the battle unfolded. We know the troops thanks to the historic record and all that. This is kind of the way it laid out 
on modern topographic maps. But we need to verify this. Like I said, this, this feature over here has been confused as Loma Alta and the lake, uh, but, but it is not. Here, here's what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the purple line here represents the state boundary of the site. This uh, orange line represents the National Historic Landmark Boundary, which was created in 1960. And this red line represents uh, the boundary of the National Historical Park, which was created. It was actually a National Historic Site in 1991 by the act of uh, Palo Alto Battlefield National Historic Site Act. To, and we have this whole battlefield. Unfortunately, right now, we still don't own a big tract of land uh, within, there's a private holding within the battlefield. So um, we came in. Um, I uh, I got lucky. Uh, my first job, permanent job with the National Park Service was at the Southeast Archaeological Center. And my supervisor was a battlefield archaeologist. Um, so I got experience in those years in 98, in the three years on on Revolutionary War battlefields, War of 1812 battlefields, and, and Civil War battlefields, including Shiloh, Chickamauga, and Chattanooga. It was great experience for me coming back to my hometown and surveying the battlefield. Now, Charles Hecker, an Ar NPS archaeologist, came down here in 92 after the after the legislation passed that created this 3,400 acre boundary, and he did a reconnaissance level survey. And he kind of identified, well, he did identify where the core battlefield is. But in order to develop the site with trails and all that, we need to do a more intensive study so we could really understand how the battle unfolded. This is how the battlefield looked with brush, mixed brush, grass, and all that prairie. You know, fortunately, the hydrology of the Rio Grande Delta had been altered by human activity during the 20th century, which allowed woody vegetation, native woody vegetation, and, and uh, to encroach upon the historic prairie at Palo Alto. This was exacerbated by vegetation clearing on, on, the, on the park, on the, on the land, and the, the, the allowance of cattle grazing on the land, which allowed prickly pear and mesquite to rapidly spread there. This is the battlefield. So I, uh, like I said, they had, in 2004, when we opened the visitor center, uh, we had a battlefield trail that went out to the core battlefield. And right away, there was push to, to develop more uh, trails. I said, instead of letting, you know, we have to comply with section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Instead of letting compliance project dictate where we do the archeology, span I wanted the archeology span to dictate where the trails went. So I uh, gridded off the, the the park in a 200 meter square grid based upon the universal trans mercator uh, uh, grid system. And I'd eventually take a board because we didn't have the money. It takes money to do archaeology. We we're doing it on a shoestring budget, which we could start based upon the partnerships I had with the Southeast Archaeological Center and Cultural Resource GIS of Washington and the father of American battlefield archaeology, Doug Scott, who did the work on the, the Battle of Little Bighorn back in the 80s and Charles Hecker who did the work in 92, he was part of our, our uh, surveys every year uh, that we did them out here. The idea was we do a checkerboard fashion to get as much information as we can, covering as, as wide of an area, and then eventually just fill in. We would eventually get uh, uh, adequate money to do this in uh, 2009, uh, which we would complete the survey, I'm sorry, in 2010, and fill in all the blanks, and we eventually. First, before we do this, this is how we do. I'll go over the methodology real quick. We'd have to clear the vegetation so we could swing the metal detector. We want to, we want to do scientific. We want to do a study. We want to move. We don't want to collect all the artifacts. We want to leave the. We want to leave some of the record intact. We want to just get a representative sample. We use based upon Doug Scott's method that he developed the Battle of Little Bighorn. We would use. Um, volunteer medical director, that's Robert Garcia, who's been on every project I had. He's a local uh, um, a local guy who uh, does this as a hobby. We do have archaeologists in line like Bernie Slaughter, but we used archaeologists like from SEAC, grad students and that, to do the bag tagging. And then these are our cultural resource GIS people that were doing the collection of data. I'll go into that a little bit more. Every hit was observed. We just did it. We did iron and metal. And we only collected 
Well, we collected everything. Modern trash, which mainly consisted of beer cans and shotgun shells, were bagged in general collection by Survey Quad, and everything uh, that was 19th century we collected with a pinpoint provenience, give it a unique bag, a unique number, and I did it. That is Charles Hecker. I'm sorry for not saying that's Charles Hecker and archaeologist Steve Kidd, who is uh, at Timaquan National Preserve in Florida. This is, man, I forgot her name. She's a grad student. She's no longer in the Park Service right now. Um, and I think, anyway, this is David Lowe, who just retired. He's a cultural resource GIS, military historian um, out there from uh, Washington, D.C. This is uh, Jessica. Um, <laughs> damn, I forgot her name. Anyway. So every night we collect, we pinpoint convenience, and we had different bag taggers. So each bag tagger would start their own metal detector numbers based with their letter name. And then at night, we every after, at the end of every day, we'd have to combine it all, check, and then check that everything had a GPS record for it. If it didn't, we'd have to go back. We'd put pin flags in it, and we'd go back the next day to make sure everything was accounted for. Eventually, like I said, yeah, it was 2010, we got the money. We would do 100% of the core battlefield area on the property that we own. So these, as you can see, the first year we did kind of like a, a hit and miss diagonal trail to get the core battlefield because we knew where it was and just fill in the gaps. And as we as we kept going in age and kept going in time and we got all the core battlefield filled in, we'd kind of spread out to get the periphery. Everything would go into a database we'd have, which would go into uh, the GIS system. And these are the artifacts you see. And we're looking at the patterns out here. You can see this is the old historic road right here. This is the road that we use. You can see the pattern. I know because I've looked at this. These are the initial lines right here. This is actually, this is the initial metro line, which would be moved up 200 meters after, after about an hour of the battle. Uh, and you see out there, and there's this gap, and this kind of represents uh, the the retreat in the night of the battlefield. A lot of uh, broken artifacts that were dropped uh, as as the Mexican army uh, uh, retreated to R Resaca de La Palma battlefield. Like I said, we we have all this in the database. We use GIS to kind of manipulate and tease a system where we can pull certain artifact classes out. Get samples. This is a this is a Mexican four pound copper cannonball. This is an iron U.S. iron six pound cannonball bef before and after conservation. And like I said, we can manipulate. This is copper canister, and which which one was fortunate. The two armies had different sizes of cannon, but also Mexico because of its silver mines had a surplus of copper. Which, you know, they were used copper, and lead all artifacts, while U.S. was strictly was mainly iron artifacts. We can start to see some of the patterns come out in the in the GIS maps that we create. Uh, we also use uh, computer generated stuff like Surfer to kind of tease out the data and all that and see. This is a, a conserved uh, spherical K shot off of I mean a canister shot. You see, like I said, we can put it out and just put different artifact classes out there and see and look in the pattern, which help us give a more accurate depiction of how the battle unfolded. You know, one thing I have to note, this battlefield was heavily collected during the during the 80s and 90s before the park came out here when it was still private land, which, which wasn't illegal, but <laughs> they consequently they concentrated on the high grade stuff like copper cannonballs, brass accoutrements. So the archeological record, it's still pretty intact, but it had a little void in there because it had been altered or impacted because of collecting during the latter part of the 20th century. We should have a lot more copper cannonballs in here. We do have some from the 92 and 93 survey, uh, but but yeah, there's, this should be represented, but that just, that is just a, a result of this area being collected uh, during the 80s, as well as brass accoutrement insignias like this. And coins, mapped everything. I'll just go through a couple of the artifacts. 
These are the Mexican uh, uniform buttons. They're solid brass disc on there. And these are the, the new buttons that just came out during this war. In the 1830s, they had a solid disc, this is a three-piece button. And the D in here in the middle of the shield stood for Dragoons, which is a, a cavalry type unit. These are the military buttons that we found uh, during our surveys. This, which I always call the wrong thing, uh, it's, it is um, a spur, uh, a spur thing. I always call it a stir for some reason, but it is a spur uh, from a US uh, soldier. And this is a mouthpiece of a bugle. And in the historic record, they talk about concentrating artillery fire. The US, US soldiers talk about concentrating artillery fire on the Mexican band that was kind of uh, uh, sounding out the commands for the Mexican army. They found that right on the line. These are uh, ramrod guides from the British Brown Best, which is the musket that the Mexican Army used before and after conservation. And as I was going to say earlier, my, my buddy Chuck Lawson, archaeologist from SEAC now over at the Denver Service Center, every time we did a survey quadrant on the road, he said, we're going to find a mini ball. And sure enough, we found a Civil War mini ball. Because this area, this whole area was highly occupied during the five years of the Civil War. We also found prehistoric artifact. Now, this is our archaic point. We found it on the surface while we're doing a metal detector survey. It has to be a manuport, a manuport, which means a human has moved it uh, because the archaic period should be definitely buried here on the prairie of Palo Alto. Uh, um, who knows? I have no idea. It was out of context. Uh, I have no idea when when it was actually left on the battlefield. And this is from the from the prior to World War One. This is a nose um, a fuse to the artillery projectiles, the French seventy five that the U.S. Army was using as it was getting ready to go into World War One. And that that kind of diluted the archaeological record, but we found that here on the property of Palo Alto Battlefield. These are the initial lines drawn out. Um, Okay, I know time, I'll, I'll just keep moving so we don't get time. And we go on to the Battle of, of Versace La Palma. Now, Palo Alto can be characterized as an artillery duel. Neither side gave up the field of battle, but the Mexican army fared a lot worse, mainly for two reasons. One, the U.S. had just developed under Major Samuel Ringold, who died from wounds received at Palo Alto, the flying artillery, which was, which was using a six-pound field artillery piece drawn by horses, which could be rapidly moved around the battlefield and repositioned and used and then moved again. Those were key in the Battle of Palo Alto, which was the first time I'd ever saw action, that, that strategy. And then we had two 18-pounders, which really weren't meant for field use. They were meant to be taken back to the fort, but since Taylor had them, he decided to pull them up the road and use it. And to me, those two 18-pounders is what kept the Mexican Army from doing a full-out infantry charge, which is where they held the advantage in number of people. And so during the night, Major Mario Anadista decided to pull his army back six miles down the road to a place called Rosac to where the road crossed Rosaca de la Palma and used the dense vegetation to negate the effects of the American artillery. It was a good choice. It was a good choice because the battle of Rosaca de la Palma was, can be characterized more as hand to hand. It was a lot more even in casualties, with Palo Alto was a lot more lopsided. But the problem is a good part of the Mexican army held their position and due to the dense press, uh, they were not engaged in the battle because the U.S. Army concentrated on the western flank or the western hemisphere of the battlefield over there. This is the current location of 34 acres. That historic map is kind of upside down. So the U.S. Army came down the road here. The Mexican army had been lined up from here all the way around here. And only this part, this is the heat of the battlefield right here. Right here, here's a map of the two army show. I'll just uh, throw out a little note in 1867, I mean, 1967, uh, Mass Barrel, when they were digging out this to build this, uh, this subdivision, uh, Mass Barrel of Mexican soldiers were discovered and grad students from the University of Texas would come down here uh, Tom Hester and, and Mike Collins would eventually become my professors and mentors out here. Uh, but the heart of the battlefield did it. As part of our survey in, in 2006, we did survey Palo Alto Battlefield. We only uh, found 
one musket ball related to the battlefield on here. Then we found some living history, modern uh, replica stuff over here where there had been an encampment in 1998. Uh, but uh, the city, in, in, as part of the planning process and our gen development, our general manager plan, the city of Brownsville decided to partner. And thanks to the help of the Brownsville Community Foundation and Mary and Frank Ituria, uh, decided to partner with a, with a park and help preserve the site of the second battle of the, of the U.S. Mexican War, Rosagna La Palma. So the city got a grant. I thought the most important, since we had already done a metal detector survey, I wanted to test the integrity of the landform. We contracted with PBS and J that did a, a systematic survey of shovel testing and backhoe trenching out there. And as as we thought, you know, the the that site, the 34 acre site of Rosario de la Palma battlefield, had been highly impacted in the 1950s as a citrus orchard, and in the 1960s it was made into a polo field. Um, out there, but regardless, it is still part of the battlefield of Versace La Palma. It is important to preserve uh, and it gives us an opportunity to reach out to the public in a safe environment, which Palo Alto, we can't have large groups out there because everything is thorny, uh, dangerous, and we have a lot of rattlesnakes out there. Out here, we can get large groups of people out here to bring them into the park, talk about the history of the park and, and, uh, and uh, engage them in, in the heritage and historic preservation. For years, we did the, the memorial illumination where we would light 8,000 uh, luminarios to honor uh, af the Saturday after Veterans Day to honor the soldiers from both, uh, both countries that fought in the battle. Unfortunately, the past three years, we have not done it in part because of the pandemic, just in, in other, for other reasons, but we hope to start to bring that back this event, um, hopefully this coming calendar year in November of 2022. Then we have the siege of Fort Brown. Um, and I know I, I still got a little bit of time. I'm trying to wrap this up quickly. Um, Fort Brown, which had been under siege from May the 3rd to 9th, the, the fort had not been completely. This is a construction drawing from 1846. This, this is in tech These, oh, I'll, I'll show you right now. This was still in construction when the fort started siege. Uh, you see the construction drawing, which had cross sections up here. This is also from uh, Mansfield uh, during the period. It shows the layout uh, with uh, the city of Matamoros, which was way the city of the, Mato, the Mexican uh, breastworks and, and Fort 14 Paredes over here uh, during the time of the battle over there. And of course, this is the big loop Saka at the university at Texas Southwest College um, out here at, at Fort Brown, which is still there today. The river, of course, has changed course. This is what it looks like. Um, it's the standing ruins are right here. This is where the, the footprint of that fort would have been drawn on the current. As recently as 18, as 1939, this right here was the course of the Rio Grande River. Uh, it's, it's changed now, and the, the golf course has changed. This is the National Historic Landmark boundary for this section. These are the standing ruins right here, and there's a canyon monument. There's a monument in 1916, the commander of Fort Brown um, placed cannons at all four uh, Mexican War battlefields, Catecitos, Palo Alto, Rosario de la Palma, and Fort Brown, with a buried it in the ground with a muzzle face in the sky to denote that a U.S. soldier gave his life. To me, I think in 1930s is when most of the fort disappeared to build what I think to build this levee. What only saved these standing ruins uh, was this um, this cannon monument that that had been placed by Colonel Parker in 1916? In 2011, this is still the driving range of the golf course, but I was able to get partner with. Like I said, I was able to do all this through partners, uh, usually on a pretty low budget. Uh, 2011. Here's the cannon monument right there. Here's the standing ruins in the back. This is when it's manicured. Right now, you wouldn't recognize it because the golf course has been abandoned for several years. In 2011, I got Steve DeVore right here, an archaeologist with MPS, to do his geophysical archaeological prospection training. Or where we would come over here, use various geophysical equipment to to look at the subsurface integrity of the battlefield without doing any ex excavations. 
This is ground penetrated radar. I got to give a shout out to Dr. Russell Skronik. He's an archaeologist who also used to work at SEAC, but he's been at UT Pan American and now UT RGB. He has done wonders for this community in, in bringing up students in archaeology, anthropology, and studying local history, local resources, local family, and getting them ready for careers in the in the in cultural resource management in the United States. Um, this is a flux eight magnetometer. This is Steve the War operating it. Uh, you cannot. He, he looks very comfortable, but you cannot have any metal on any of your clothing while you're doing this. And this is the electric relativity. This is a UTPA student, Robin, and this is a, a professor from England who was one of the instructors in the course. This is the the results of the of the ground penetrating radar, which I've been using for years down here to try to you can barely see the information in there. You can see part of the fort. You, you might think I'm crazy, but you can see it. Um, then here's the the magnetometer, and this you got all the iron. These are these are the utility lines over us. And you can see the fort, the bastion of, of the fort right here. But we would discover that it was electric resistivity that would give us the clearest picture out here on the battlefield, and that's that just goes. I, like I said, I've done GPR on Palo Alto trying to, to identify the road. But unfortunately, it just was not the right tool for the job. And I, I know now that uh, electric relativity is, is the way to go. We we're able to survey the whole battlefield thanks to uh, HDR, who was working for the border wall for the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security. You get a survey of that complete battlefield out there. Unfortunately, this area has been abandoned. This is the, 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 the marker and all that. Let me see if I don't have a, a wait, sorry. Forgive me for that. Um, fortunately, this golf course is bad and it looks nothing like this, but there is legislation right now in the House and subcommittee trying to go forward to bring the site of the original earthen works, which are actually standing ruins from 1846, um, into the into the Palo Alto battlefield. Please feel free. I, I, uh, I'm not asking you to, but if y'all feel so inclined, reach out to your congressman and Filio Vela and your senator John Fordin to support, show support to preserve this important site, this important part of our heritage, which actually has standing ruins from 1846 there. Because what would start here in the spring of 1846 would lead to the first time that the U.S. Army would occupy a foreign capital and events that would forever change the face of the North American continent with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and Mexico ceding over half of its national territory. This would also forge the relationship between these two young republics, which still remains um, neighbors. Going to the Civil War, this is a map of the Civil War. I believe I'm getting close to time, so I'll kind of just go through this, end up. Well, I know. Are, what's that? You you don't have to end until at seven seven? twenty seven twenty. Oh, seven. I thought I was supposed to end at seven. Okay. No, no well, but <laughs> also that, that I am in, then I'll end early. But we'll just go into Palmito Ranch a little bit, which I think I have quite a few slides. The last battle. Oh, let me just go back then. Two slides. Okay, this is a map of Texas during the Civil War. During the Civil War, let me take a drink. Federal forces would have a really tight naval blockade from, from the Carolinas down to the mouth of the Rio Grande River. It was tight. This is um, this is where the Rio Grande Delta and this area, this region would become so important to the Confederacy. There's a way for the for the cotton that was grown in the Trans Mississippi West of the Confederacy to come make it to the market. Try to make a lifeline so they can fund the army. Yeah, anybody knows logistics, money. It takes a lot of money to to go into a war and to fight a war and to win a war. And the South had been blockaded for trade with Europe. This the Rio Grande Delta, and it was bringing cotton, getting it on. Mexican ships 
and being able to go to Europe was a lifeline for the Confederacy. Fortunately, which I won't say much more than a lot of people had their hand in the pie and not everything went. Unfortunately, like I said, it's, uh, I'm not saying unfortunately, but unfortunate for the Confederate Army, they did not reap the full benefits of this. So this is a period map with what existed here. There was a battle of Las Rusias. There was a lot of action during the the full uh, four years of the Civil War. I'm sorry if I said five years earlier. This area saw a lot of action, and the uh, and after eighteen after the summer of eighteen sixty four, federal troops would be um, held or kept on Brazos Santiago Island. The, the Fort Brown would change hand twice during the battlefield. And there would just be a lot of activity down here. We lead to the Battle of Palmito Ranch, which is known as last battle. It was fought May 11th through the 13th, with the afternoon of the 13th being the highlight of the battlefield. It was Theodore Barrett was a federal commanding officer. He was he had not had a lot of battlefield experience. There's the, the Battle of of Palmetto Ranch is surrounded or just engulfed in a lot of myth and stories. There, you know, some accounts just have it as a huge battle um, with lots of soldiers, a lot of people dying, a lot of casualties. Um, this is John Ford. And others, and I'll tell you, my my uh, deduction based upon the archaeological record and the evidence, it was more of a series of uh, of of skirmishes that went and not a lot of uh, not a lot of casualties at the battle. This is a uh, uh, Texas Ranger Rip Ford, who was a Confederate commander here, who uh, showed up the last, uh, who came with uh, uh, cavalry from the fort on the afternoon of May 13th and routed the the federal troops back to the island. As recently as 1997, the Battle of Palmetto Ranch became a national historic landmark. Let me say. There are only about 2,500 National Historic Landmarks throughout the country, um, as opposed to National Register sites. So it's a little tough to, to become a National Historic Landmark. But Cameron County has actually four, um, four National Historic Landmarks within the bounty. It's uh, Palo Alto, Rosario La Palma, Fort Brown, and, and Palmito Ranch. This became a landmark a lot in part because it had such integrity of setting and character, uh, which essentially this landform had not changed since the Civil War. You could see the area as much as in similar conditions as the soldiers of the Civil War did. Unfortunately, that has changed a lot in the past couple of years. This is a uh, site, this is Fort Brown down here. This is out to uh, Boca Chica Pass, and this is Brazos Santiago Island. This served as the war for the U.S. Mexican War, and this was where the the federal troops were ho were housed or are detained uh, since 1846. And this is what we draw the Battle of of um, the the Battle of uh, Palmito Ranch. With a core battle of skirmish at the beginning of the, of the fight on, on the evening of May the 11th. And this is the afternoon core battle for the um, May the 13th, 1865, right here. Now, over the years, um, through partnerships, uh, when I first actually, the summer that I first came back here and after leaving SEAC in, in 2001, uh, Doug Scott and Charlie Secker were doing a project here at Palmito Ranch on Fish and Wildlife property uh, from a grant that the that the city had received uh, to do this. I was able to participate in that and uh, then conduct after that conduct uh, my own survey on private property thanks to to Bobby Ledma who graciously let me go on his land and mow. We have to mow the area and. Uh, uh, and then with T Texas Historical Commission, we partnered to do surveys over here. This in part, the Civil War Trust had acquired a three acre plot here, uh, which it donated to the Texas Historical Commission with the military sites coordinator, Milio Order. We uh, cleared it and did some survey up there. Uh, this last year in 2021, Texas Historical Commission 
deemed this a state site. So they, uh, there's actually a state site there. They're building an overlook and they're going to help interpret the Battle of Palmetto Ranch along with Fish and Wildlife out here. Uh, the Park Service doesn't own any property out here at Palmetto Ranch, but since it's a National Historic Landmark, the Park Service administers National Historic Landmark, the Heritage Partnership Program, which uh, we have a, we have a, uh, the program is out based recently out of Denver. And uh, we, we partner because we have a vested interest in it. We partner with Fish and Wildlife to interpret the sites. These are both Department of Interior agencies. Here is uh, the, another map of the same site of the, of the 2001 and 2002 surveys that we did. Uh, this is Chris Adams, Forest Service archaeologist, Larry Lug retired, MPS archaeologist, and Heather Young. Uh, curator for the mid Midwest region. She used to be in the Southwest region with us. This is why we look, this is a survey tragic cutting through the field. We just mow it so we can uh, survey um, the, the battlefield in a reconnaissance level fashion. These are the bullets we found from, from this initial survey on there, both US and, and Confederate. Musket balls we found from the battlefield and a button from the Civil War out there. Not a lot of artifacts, which kind of led me to believe we did cover a lot of ground. We did it. I, I have really good metal detector people out there. We did during the both sessions. And so I know it's really not there. Then I said, like in 2010, we partnered with THC to do more survey up here on the, on the, on the hill of Palmetto Hill. This was the partnership with THC. We cleared the ground out there, which is now the state state's historic site. Doug, in five match, we, we surveyed the field that had been plowed and kind of grown over. We didn't get a chance to mow this before we did, but there was a lot of bare earth, so we were able to to uh, to survey that area. Uh, we did find a period button, which you really can't say it was battle related or anything. And we also found this artifact, which I found when I worked Civil War battlefields, I found this artifact and it always, it always stunts people what it is. It's actually a coffee grinder. We can't say it was from the battle. It's easy. I mean, there were pickets, there was camp throughout the full four years of the battlefield out there. So it could easily have been from soldier, but it also could have been from domestic use because, you know, everybody, everybody used coffee. Still do today, I guess, you know, <laughs> and, uh, we also have evidence of the changing of the river, which I believe I would post on the next map. This is from the 1898 boundary survey, which this commission, the International Boundary Water Commission, was created as a result of the of the U.S. Mexican War. Yeah, here are the courses of the river based on on the map. One of the things we did discover or, or did identify as a possible location of the Telegraph Road uh, on the in the 2001 survey of the Bobby Ledma property. We know this is based on all this, which we covered a lot of ground. This is the artifacts that we found that we could definitely tie to the Civil War battlefield. It does represent part of the what's represented in the historic record that part of the 45th Indiana troops had a picket and withheld the the briefly withheld the the Confederate cavalry charge, while the while the majority of federal troops, 82nd Color troops, were able to go down the Telegraph Road and get back to. Uh, to uh, Boca Chica, to the Boca Chica Pass, and back on to Brazos Santa Island. Like I said, the archaeological evidence tells me it was a very light battle with few casualties. A good part of the 45th Indiana did get trapped in this little peninsula over here, and some had to cross the river. Some died, some might not have died, but uh, but that is what the archaeological record tells me. Here is a close up of the 45th standoff with uh, Confederate and, and uh, Union uh, artifacts on the ground all over. This is the boundary, the National Historic Landmark boundary. I think it's about 9,000 acres. And this yellow area is fish and wildlife uh, property. And so they own the majority of the battlefield. So, um, Sorry, Barbara. Uh, it's 7.05. We did have 50 minutes. I do want to tell you, come volunteer at Palo Alto Battlefield. There's a lot of opportunity. Next week, we're going to be planting core grass as part of the cultural landscape restoration. 
Barbara, Robert, Joni, and Barbara Rodriguez have been helping out. We'll have some uh, in, uh, students from UTRGB, and we'll have a crew from uh, Student Conservation Association, uh, Gulf Corps out of Corpus. But aside from that, I always try and provide uh, volunteer opportunities uh, for uh, for text match naturalists and try and change it up as much as I can. But a, a lot of it's vegetation management because part of the big project, now that I've done the archaeology, um, which uh, which uh, we won't do anymore in Palo Alto until we get that big private inholding, uh, um, to restoring and maintain the cultural landscape as directed in the 1992 uh, legislation. And uh, yeah, this is a slide I forgot to put in. I, I didn't do it justice. We also are tentatively having a living history, our living history program, which is usually the first Saturday of the month, uh, which is interrupted in October for the archaeology fair, which we've done both virtual the past two years and, and uh, memorial illumination, which we've also haven't been able to do in November. Uh, but we did a living history event uh, the first weekend in January, January the 8th. And uh, we plan to do one the first Saturday in February. I'm not sure the date, but we will be at the Versace de la Palma. Uh, please visit our, the National Parks website, Palo Alto Battlefield's website, to get more information on that. Uh, but and I'll, I'll coordinate with Barbara and Robert on on providing opportunities. Like I said, uh, next week we do have some planning, and we're going to have some more planning and grass splitting coming up. We're going as part of the cultural landscape restoration. And with that, I thank you for your attention, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll be glad to entertain any questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Rolando? If if you have a question, you can also just unmute and ask it now. Um, what would be the best place to do look for artifacts in the Rio Grande Valley around Falcon Lake or? <laughs> As a as an archaeologist, I do not encourage looking for <laughs> artifacts unless you just leave them in place. Falcon Lake is a good place. There is it is a good place out there out in the open. Okay, first you definitely need landowner permission. And it's hard to recognize. One thing I was saying about the 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 prehistoric and the Rio Grande Delta, a lot of archaeology, professional archaeologists that come down from different parts of the country don't recognize. The archaeological record here because it's it's comprised of, of shell artifacts and not really stone artifacts. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, uh, I I can't really condone going out. Well, I can't. I definitely don't condone collecting. We we'll kind of want to see artifacts. There there are a lot of places you got to look for arroyos after rain, fresh cuts. Um, there's prehistoric all sorts anywhere. There's all sorts of archaeologies everywhere. You know, from the 20th century on back anywhere. Archaeology is a study of past human cultures. So you have ranch land or whatever, you have archaeology resource, archaeological resources on your property. Okay, second question. Um, I found a really big piece of sandstone on family property in Atascosa County, and it has okay. some striations on it that someone suggested to me could be like an abrader stone or a shaft straightener. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't know. It could also be like um, oil field is there a way I could show that to you? Get your contact information. Yes, and tell yes. Me? I'll be glad. I'll be glad for Barbara to share my contact information. And if I don't recognize it, I definitely, I, I, I'm definitely, got way over the fact that I don't know something. I'll, I'll pass you on to another archaeologist who might know. Hook you up with a with a with with a Texas Historical Commission who has archaeological reviewers for all the all parts of Texas, and they also have archaeological stewards in that area. Um, which, which is cool, but yeah, and I want to say, you know, I don't condone collecting, but on private property, that's, you know, it's totally legal. Don't, don't, don't be ashamed. Okay. You can have collections. Okay. And I try, I try and work with all the people who collected in the eighties and get the information. I don't necessarily want unprevenient artifacts from the battle of Palo Alto, but I do want the information that they could tell me. And that's what's important. It's the information and the story and the part of our heritage that that it that it transmits that's important to us. Thank you. No problem, Bobby. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Please send me an email once once you get your my information from from uh, from Barbara. Great. And you're going Rolando. To 
I'm sorry. Yolanda, when you were talking about somewhere where you all were clearing the field or something, and you said that there was lots of rattlesnakes, where exactly are you talking oh, about? Pa Palo Alto Battlefield. Palo Alto Battlefield. We've done living history on a Saturday right by the visitor center. We got we got rattlesnakes all the time. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, unfortunately, uh, it's my job to to relocate them. They become a hazard to human for human contact. Which, wow. Uh, I'm growing. Thanks to some good volunteers, uh, Gus Renfro and Jim Campbell. I'm getting trained on how to relocate them. But, okay. Yeah, I, I try not to touch them too much. <laughs> but they're, they're beautiful. They're beautiful animals, and they're like I said, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. And and as long as you see them first, you're not in any danger. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. But they're they're beautiful. Definitely, all all snakes are are beautiful. All animals are beautiful. Including humans. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Sorry. That's what Barbara likes about me, right, Barbara? <laughs> I say yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> he's, he's always, we volunteered with uh, um, Rolando clearing invasives, um, Brazilian pepper at Resaca de la Palma, and planting the cord grass that he's trying to, uh, cutting these bunches of cord grass into little plugs and planting hundreds of them so that they can then be planted, which I, I think what you're going to do next week, plant. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do it next week with, with a few rooted. from SEA and we'll, we're probably not going to be able to finish all the plugs we have. So we'll definitely need more volunteers after the SEA crew leaves. So, yeah. So and you'll let me, let me know when there are times that you want TMN volunteers. Yes, yes. Okay. And we will then make it available especially to the class and then also to the to, to the membership. But um great. Rolando, if anybody volunteers um where you're at, do we have to fill out an application with you before we volunteer there? Not an application, just a volunteer form. Okay. And that form protects you and covers you and tells you what to do. But it'll cover you on the workman's comp. So if you get injured, which we don't get injured, <laughs> we, work, we work safely. Safely is always an important part. Every time, if y'all come out and volunteer, one of the first things we're going to do is have a safety talk. And it's very important. So I don't want anybody injured. I don't want to get injured. And, uh, and we want to have, we want to have a, a productive time and a fun time. <laughs> it's going to be fun because you're outside. You're working in nature and you're doing something. That helps. And I, I, one thing I, I definitely want to say this 3,400 acre parcel of land that is Palo Alto battlefield. As time goes on and, and urban small continues to grow, it's going to be so important to the native ecosystem and native wildlife of this area. Out there, we, you know, we, we have breeding pair of alpha model falcons on site. It's wonderful for doing raptors and all sorts of birding. And we have reptiles and rattlesnakes and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's a really cool place. It's, I couldn't imagine when I went to Texas Southmost College in 1985, maybe, yeah, I couldn't imagine me landing a job like this. This is this is a dream job for me, for sure. Oh, baby. This passion comes out. <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry, I do that to people. No, no it's it's our dachshund. I have a question. He's, oh. he's making a lot of noise. Oh, it's okay. It's my cat, and I didn't want to feed him before I fed him. He's just looking at me and and looking at the bag of cat food. So I'll feed him as soon as I I turn off my my video. Rolando, you had a question for Ricardo. Okay, Ricardo, um, go ahead. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Mr. Garza, I had a question. You were talking about legislation um, to the old fort. Oh. Uh -huh. Um, about bringing it into the national parks, would that mean actually moving the structures, or would that be like a satellite? Um, yeah, just be our it would be our third unit, and actually, okay. international boundary and water owns of that parcel of the abandoned golf course, and they're willing to transfer it, but we can't take it until our boundary is changed, either through legislation or a presidential uh, monument declaration. So yeah, no, we would have a presence out there at the old golf course at Fort Brown and preserve. And it's, I mean, they're standing ruins. It's so important to me. To me, that is the rock star of the three Mexican War battlefields here in Cameron County. 
because they're standing ruins. And there's nothing like taking somebody out. I'm I'm restoring the cultural landscape. You know, we're talking Little Palma has been pretty much lost to urban development. I'm restoring the cultural landscape in Palo Alto so people can come out and see the battlefield as the soldiers saw in 1846. But there's a piece of the fort that's still standing from 1846, and it's overlooking the Rio Grande River. You can see in the Matamoros from there. And, you know, it's, it takes a lot of imagination, but, hell, what is life without imagination, right? Then are there any, um, what's the word? Is there any, you mentioned Fort Polk, where I didn't, I didn't see uh, where, Polk, like, modern Fort day. Where would that okay. where would that locate Fort, it modern day? Fort Polk is uh, the lighthouse in 1853. The lighthouse in Port Isabel was built in the center of Fort Polk. If that gives you an idea, so it's right there on that on that square right there. And it's a Brazos Santa Agua Island that passed the fishing village of Port Isabel was always important. And Matamoros was a major port in the beginning of the 19th century, along the lines of Galveston, New Orleans, and, and uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and Veracruz. That's why in Matamoros and in Brownsville, you see influence of, of Charleston and New Orleans type architecture out here. Because and because Matamoros served as a port to the northern industrial capital, which was Monterrey back then in the, at the at the late eight late uh, I always mess this up late eighteen hundreds early nineteen nineteen hundreds. I can't go back from the 18th century, century to 1800 and all that. I, I screwed up. I hey, Tony, what I was going to say. Shout out to me? Tony, my good buddy Tony. Yeah. Hey, what what do you know about the fish camp that was across from Baghdad on the U.S. side? Because it's gone now, but I'm curious about the two the fish camp, right, right on. Um, I am not sure. Right across the river, which I know the river has changed a little bit. I've been over there. I've looked at a lot of uh, things that people want to say. Oh, this is Baghdad, which I am. I am not sure. But uh, there are brick. There, there are structural remains, but in, in ruin, not standing at all, not intact. Out there on this side of the river, opposite of where Baghdad would have been, which it could easily be being part of Baghdad because the river has changed course. Uh, you know, uh, we kind of stopped it during the 20th century. I said we as human beings with the damming of the river and, and all the drainage, drainage network that we built started in 1912. But I don't know, Tony, about the fishing village there. The fishing village at Bahia Grande. That either. <laughs> Sorry, you're going beyond my knowledge. <laughs> I think I'm like, hey. You get old enough and experienced enough to say, yeah, hey, I don't know, man. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tony, Tony. Yeah, Tony and I had graduate class together under Dr. The, Dr. Gene Paul, which I got to give a shout out to Dr. Gene Paul. I don't know if y'all know him. In 85, 86, when I was at Texas Southmost College, I I thought he was the shit. I thought he was so cool, man. He was cool because he was a teacher. His work, and then in the summer, he'd go down to Central and South America and study. He was he was an anthropologist. He was also an anthropologist who got his uh, bachelor's at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Though, uh, and what is the 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 uniform that's all white uh, in in College Town? Is it University of Pennsylvania? No, what is it? Penn State. Penn State. Sorry, Penn that's State. it. <laughs> I, I had Dr. lunch Paul with him. Too. He was so cool. <laughs> He, yeah, that, he was great. He was my idol. He was my hero. He hates when I tell him that. You're my hero, Dr. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you gotta well, have hero, you gotta have heroes and you gotta have mentors in this life. And that's important. Absolutely. I did remember what I was gonna say. Good. We are trying to plan a field trip with Rolando out at Palo Alto. So oh. that is we've been going back and forth. On yeah. trying to find a date that that would work for him, so we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's really neat for him to. You saw the maps, and when when you're there, you're out on the trails, and he's saying that was over there. It's it's really neat. As as y'all might have noticed, I ramble all over the place. Y'all can get me on any all sorts of any different rabbit holes. So. 
I'll be glad. And I can talk. I can talk yeah. nonstop. I promise. <laughs> well, you do great, Rolando. And I'm glad it's actually you let me 720. tell you that it was seven. Yeah, see, 720 exactly when you're when your your part's supposed to be over, and uh -huh. they have a 10 minute break before uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Okay, cool. And I'm gonna stick around because uh, Juan is a good friend of mine, and I want to see his presentation. Awesome. And hopefully, hopefully, maybe next week we can do our our tour at Palo Alto Battlefield, where we actually have some crews out planting. <laughs>